we'll be reading the first six verses and then skip to chap, uh, verses 9 and then on down through 15. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, to, go and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. Skip down to verse 9, would you? So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again unto thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I, I thought he would strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Or not Abana and Farper, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then he went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing upon the reading of your word. And our gathering would be worth the coming if all we but did was to read it. But as we continue and meditate a bit, in the next minutes, we pray that you might make the application to heart. We know that there's nothing here by accident. There is no random thought. These are things in your word that are there on purpose. And so we just pray that you might help us to discern your purposes in giving it to us and work within the hearts and lives of people as we are gathered here, as we are focused together upon this portion of your word. Help me to be clear and communicate it clearly, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a weekend when we remember those who have served, and especially those that have served with the ultimate sacrifice, as Pastor Isaac mentioned. It's a special day of day when we remember those in our armed services. There will be parades and ceremonies. There will be a marathon of TV programs, war movies, and such on the television. There will be a lot of remembrances made and stories told of heroic deeds and patriotic acts. I remember reading about a Sergeant Major Hank Beck, who had received the Distinguished Service Cross for action that he took over 50 years ago in Vietnam. Beck and his team were dropped by helicopter over a blind landing zone near a supposed secret Viet Cong base. Seconds after their helicopter took off the men in the front of the patrol line started dropping, shot by sniper fire. To 
protect his team, Specialist 4 Beck exposed himself to enemy fire, threw a smoke grenade, and called for suppressive fire while he ran across open terrain toward the enemy. He said, I threw a hand grenade in and I hosed them down with my machine gun. After killing those two, he moved on to two more North Vietnamese soldiers who spotted him near the sniper position. Beck said he heard over the radio that a fellow recon team was pinned down by machine gun fire. And again, the, the uh, citation said, without regard to his personal safety and extreme personal risk, Specialist 4 Beck turned and charged the gun position alone and succeeded in killing the surprise five, surprised five-man gun crew. Those kinds of tales are typical right around these this time of year. Beck would be called, in Bible terms, in, in Bible days, he would be called a mighty man of valor. That's how he would have been termed. Many such narratives will be talked about on this weekend. There will be tales of sacrifice and courage and patriotism. But today we're talking about an individual here in 2 Kings chapter 5 who was a soldier, a patriot, not of our country, not of even of Israel, but significantly of Syria. A Gentile of a nation hostile to Israel. And it's such an unusual portion of scripture because he's the central character a Gentile, a main character in the narrative we're looking at today. And that is in part why he is so significant. His name is Naaman. And this, is, this account of Naaman is the account of a very prominent man, a very prominent man. Verse 1 tells us that he was captain of the host of Syria. Now, captains are mid-level officers in our in our military. Below them are lieutenants and sergeants, and then above them are majors and colonels and generals. But that's not what he was. He would be the equivalent of uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the one who is the uh, one who coordinates all the other branches of service. He would be the guy, if you saw him on TV, he would have like a cluster of medals all over his chest. He was the leader, the captain, the main man, the supreme commander of the armies of Syria. He was a national hero. If you look at verse 1 again, it talks about him, a, a man who was honorable. That word honorable is literally high, exalted, lifted up. The idea is that he was highly respected and distinguished. And, and God makes the comment here in this passage, by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. That's an interesting comment, that in a country that was not in Israel, it says that God granted through Naaman deliverance from their enemies. And deliverance means that he had defended his nation successfully against aggressors. He loved his country. He loved Syria. Syria loved him. He was a Syrian patriot. He was a man of profound courage. What does the scripture call him here? A mighty man of valor in chapter 5. Mighty man of valor means he was brave. He was courageous. He was a fighter. He was no stranger to conflict. He had proved himself on the field of battle. He kept his head when others were confused or afraid. He had looked death in the eye many times. This is what this means when it says he was a mighty man of valor. It wasn't a whole lot that rattled Naaman. He had he had seen it all. 
And we point out that his, his position was not due to family uh, name or inheritance or wealth. He earned his position. He was promoted because of it. And the Bible tells us, again, that he was a great man with his master. That tells us that he was a man of character. He, he had the characteristic of loyalty to the one who was the leader of the country. He had integrity. Means, in part, this means that he wouldn't lie to get out of trouble. He wasn't in it for his own sake. He took responsibility for his actions. You know, this, in this age, people shirk responsibilities and demand rights. Not so with Naaman. If he said, I'll do it, he'd do it. If he said, I'll be there, he was there. He was brave, loyal, honorable. What many would consider a good man by most standards. But he was also, the Bible tells us, an afflicted man, right? Out the gate in verse 1, it tells us all these wonderful things about him, but it tells him that he had an affliction, and that affliction was leprosy. It was a disease that affected his body. We are not told in the narrative how advanced it was. Apparently, it advanced to the point that most people knew about it. It was common knowledge. We don't really encounter leprosy here uh, in this, this country. At the time, especially, it was not only unsightly, but it was often terminal. It, it if in its advancing stages, affects the nerves. People lose control of their, their limbs and what they're able to do, their coordination. It, it can cause severe eye damage. Because of the nerve damage, there may be a lack of ability to feel pain. It is often true in... in, in uh, these countries where leprosy is common, that many of these people, they, their ends of their fingers or even uh, large portions of their fingers were, they're, they're, they're not there. I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to be uh, gross here, but uh, sometimes the nerves are so affected that rats would come and gnaw on people's fingers and they're not aware of it. Infections can enter in in damaging the nerve, the, the fingers and the, the toes especially. Wounds can go unnoticed and infection can set in. It can be really, really bad. This is what he had. A disease that affected his life. And depending upon its degree, the Bible, you know, just the fact that it's here suggests that it was somewhat serious. It could hinder his marital relationship, could hinder his social life. Certainly, uh, depending on where it was, if it was on his face or wherever it might be, it might be something that he was very self-conscious about. It might have been especially significant to him because his very name, the word Naaman, means pleasantness, beautiful, agreeable, delightful. And sometimes people were named after their, their characteristics. So that name may have been applied to him in his youth as a very manly, handsome guy. And this disease it is, was often terminal. The end result was death. It's a bacterial disease. And everyone and that day probably knew someone who had passed away with leprosy. He was an afflicted man. But we're also told in the narrative that he was a loved man. He was a loved man. Verse 2 um, tells us that the Syrians had gone out by companies, meaning these were raiding parties that bordered Israel. They went out and they made raids. And they had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, a young girl. We're not told how old she was at this point, but the suggestion is she'd been in captivity a number of years. 
But note what it says in verse 3. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now think about it. If you, if your town had been raided by, by a foreign enemy and someone had come in and captured you and perhaps, we don't, we're not told this, but perhaps killed her parents. We don't know that. We don't know those details. But certainly they kidnapped her away from her, the place where she was grown up and her family and took her into a foreign land and made her a slave girl. Now, if that had been you or I in that position, we might have, by compulsion, had to serve but we might have been thinking th thoughts like, if our master had leprosy, I hope he rots. <laughs> that, I mean, really, right? I mean, my life, he's disrupted my life. The Syrians, I hate the Syrians. And this guy deserves everything he's got coming. That's not what she said. She said, I wish he were with the prophet in Samaria because he could recover him. He could heal him. This little captive Israelite maid who served his wife, someone who'd been abducted from her home and her family, a victim of war, if you will, she had every reason to hate him for conquering her country and taking her away. However, out of concern, she wished that he would visit the prophet of God back home. That news made it to the king. News travels fast. He was loved by his captive. He was loved by his king. Scripture says somebody went in, told his Lord, meaning the king. The king of Syria said, okay, we're going to take care of this. I'm going to take a letter. Dress it to the king of Israel. I want you to heal Naaman. Why would that king do that? Because he loved him. His captive loved him. His king loved him. This is how special this guy was. And God was going to do a work in his life. And no doubt in the lives of others as well. Now with all of these things about Naaman, this national hero, this authoritative individual, this a man of profound courage and honorable character and you know, afflicted as he was, but loved. He was, lastly, and more importantly than all of these other things, he was a lost man. This was his main problem. He did not know the God of heaven. He was a lost man. He worshipped a false god called Rimen. Now, how do we know that? Because later on in the narrative, in verse 18, he talks about the fact that he accompanies the king into the, the temple of Rimen. And Rimen was a, the Syrian equivalent of Baal. So if you're not familiar with Rimen, but you have heard about Baal, they're similar. This god was also called Hadad, which is where Syrian rulers get their name. If, in fact, if you saw uh, the name Ben-Hadad, Ben meaning son of Hadad, you're talking about Rimen. It was a hideous religion. A religion that sacrificed children, placed infants, sacrificed infants into the foundation gates and walls of public building, of public buildings. And we don't know that Naaman was involved in that. We don't know anything about that. But we do know we do know that he was part of that deity's worship. We do know that he did not know the God, the one and true God. He was an idolater. He was a sinner. How do I know that? Because the Bible says we all are sinners. That's how we know. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you've sinned. That means I have. And we've come short from what God expects of us. We are unacceptable. Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. 
What was true of you and I was true of Naaman. And despite all of his admirable qualities, his, his character, his courage, his honor on the battlefield, his loyalty, the fact that he was a great patriot, for all of those qualities, he lacked the righteousness that comes only by faith. So he had a double predicament. He had a physical problem, but he had a spiritual problem. By the way, you and I do too. I mean, all of us, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if you're familiar with the date, death rate. The death rate is 100%. <laughs> all of us. We have a physical affliction that one day time is going to run out for you and I and also have a spiritual situation as well. Same thing as Naaman. He was reminded of it because of this physical affliction, but you and I have, you know, we, I remember one time a guy, an older guy, he's not quite as old as I am now, but excuse me, he was older than I am now. Let me put it that way. And he told me that he prayed for me every day. But he said he recently got news that he, he had leukemia. And he said, I, he's telling me personally, he said, I went home and I thought, I have a terminal disease. He's, and he's telling me, he goes, but then he said, it occurred to me, I've always had a terminal disease. <laughs> it's called sin. The wages of sin is death. So what was true of Naaman is also true of you and I, this very prominent man. But as we continue with the narrative, I want you to notice he was a man whose pride almost condemned him. We didn't read verse 7, but it shows the, uh, the let's, let's read it now. Verse 7, it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter <laughs> that he rent his clothes which was a sign of dismay in that day. And said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man descended me to a man to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, see how he seeks a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent unto the king, saying, wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. This was, this was an entourage. This was, this was a large group of people that showed up at Elisha's door. Picture yourself, you know, a whole bunch of, of black escalades come rolling into your driveway. Out comes secret service. You know, they're, they all got sunglasses on and they're looking around and young guard. You look out your window and you know somebody's important there. And you send one of your kids and say, go see who that is. <laughs> this is, this is Elisha. He's, he doesn't go out himself. He sends a servant. It was very obvious that a prominent man with his entourage pulls up in front of Elisha's house. And Naaman gets out of his chariot and stands there waiting for Elisha to come out, and he doesn't. Elisha sent a messenger, verse 10. So this man came in impressive grandeur. Elisha sends a messenger out to him and says, go dunk yourself in a muddy river. There was a preacher that I knew of, he, he entitled his his message, seven ducks in a muddy river. <laughs> Elisha sent a messenger saying, go and wash in Jordan seven times. Now, that wasn't what Naaman was expecting. He got very angry about that and left in disappointed expectations. He expected, verse 11 tells us what he expected. Naaman said, I thought... He will surely come out to me. He expected the prophet to come meet him. Not a servant, the prophet. I want the main man. Imagine making, trying to make an appointment with some official in, in Lansing or Washington, D.C., and you want to talk to a representative or a senator, 
and you, you, you make arrangements that this is all taking place and letters have been sent ahead of time and, and you go there and they send out a secretary. And you have taken your time at your expense. Naaman thought that the prophet that he had heard so much about would surely come out to meet him. I thought he will surely come out to me. And he expected a dramatic display on his behalf. And that this prophet was going to come out and stand. I mean, it was going to be dramatic. Stand and call upon his God. And the Bible tells us, and put his, wave his hand over the place. I mean, it was going to be like Benny Hinn. It's going to be a faith healing display. I mean, the jacket was going to come off and he's going to twirl that around. And, and there was going to be a healing and people were going to go nuts. I thought, I thought this is the way it's going to be. This is Naaman's expectation. It is here in the narrative. Strike his hand over the place. There was going to be personal attention. But instead, what? He was told to go wash himself in a muddy river. So he expected the prophet to come and meet him. He expected a dramatic display on his behalf. He expected personal attention. And what did he get? He gets told by a servant to go wash in a muddy river. And he responds in verse 20, or verse 12 rather, are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel. Um, these rivers, uh, the Abana River in verse 12 is now called Narbarada, and the Farpar River is now called Narel Awaj. It was in ancient times, I don't know how it is now, but in ancient times was known uh, to flow through Damascus, Syria, and Syria uh, in that particular area where those rivers were referred to, uh, it was referred to, this area was called the Garden of the World. So when Naaman said, are not these rivers better? You know what the answer to that was? Yes. I mean, I, I hate to bust anybody's bubble here, but I have been where, at the, uh, where the Jordan River starts up in the north of Israel, where it starts to flow down through the mountains. It is wonderful. It is clear. It's like a clear mountain stream. The further south you get, it turns into a muddy river. There's a lot of, a lot of dirt. And you, you can't see the bottom. Let me just tell you that. And if you were to, you were to take a bath in the, in the Jordan River, you would need a shower afterwards. By contrast, the River Jordan is pathetic. So he was right. Are not the rivers in Syria far better? Washing in the Jordan River was insulting. Those rivers were better. But there was more, than, more to his indig indignation. He says, go wash and you will be clean. You know where there's an, insi an, an insinuation there? That there was something wrong with him. He was not clean. He was asked to bathe. And by that meaning, you know, going up and down in the water seven times. But the insinuation there was that he was not acceptable. Morally. You see, in Leviticus chapter 13, verses 42 to 46, you needn't turn there, but in the Old Testament, leprosy was a person who had that was considered unclean and could not freely fellowship with the community until they were judged clean. So, in one sense, he was being demeaned in his mind. And Elisha doesn't ask. You notice the, the narrative here? Go wash yourself. That was not, that was an order. That was a command. He didn't say, pretty please, would you do this? This is the 
commander of all of the armies of Syria, a very powerful man, you don't tell him to do stop. He gives the orders. This is what, this is who this person is. He, ex he didn't like the message. He didn't like the manner. He expected personal attention, dramatic treatment. And he got angry. Scripture says he went away in a rage. That word rage means hot. I mean, did you ever hear, hear somebody, man, was he ever hot? This is the word. He was hot. Why was he hot? The treatment. I have personally seen lost people angry or offended at being told that they are a sinner and that they have to admit that in front of a holy God before they can be saved. They have to know this. I had a man tell me that he was not bad enough when I told him he needed to be saved. He goes, I'm not bad enough to need to be saved. He found it personally offensive for anyone to suggest that he was not a good guy. And then to tell someone that they need to give public testimony to that fact by following a believer's baptism, which, you know, believer's baptism is a picture of cleansing. It doesn't cleanse in and of itself. It's a picture of that. It's a picture of identifying with the Savior who washes and cleanses, and the going down underneath the water and coming up symbolizes the resurrection and the cleansing that has already taken place. But that's what that means. It's a very humbling admission. And this great and powerful Syrian general being told that he is unclean and he has to go wash, not just once, but seven times. And we're not going to go into all the significance of the number seven in scripture, but it's a very significant number associated with God himself. And so here he was being told this going away hot. But the, the, the wonderful thing about this is it's all part of the, the, the process by which he came to faith in God. We see him humbled in the narrative. This man who was humbled, a man's man. A man who'd been used to doing it his way. Someone said whatever he needed, he bought whatever got in front of him. He knocked it down. Wherever he needed to go, he went and he said, I'm going to deal with this leprosy the same way. And now what he needs is to be humbled. And God was about to humble him. Certainly humbled by his condition. This powerful general had this hideous disease. His station in life meant nothing. And he had to realize that. He was sent on a mission initiated by a little slave girl and ordered by his king. There's no evidence at all that he wanted to be there. He didn't have a choice. He was being sent to an enemy for healing. I mean, how humiliating that is. These were, Israel at this time was paying tribute to Syria. Syria and the Israelites were a conquered country. Syrians typically did not like Israelis. But the worst part about it is that he was being treated like a needy person, not an important person. Someone said that uh, Elisha didn't treat him like an important person. And that was his major sin. <laughs> For him, from Naaman's standpoint. Verse 13, his servants came near. This is when he's, he's in, a, in a rage. His servants came near and spake to him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather than when he says to you, wash and be clean? Someone pointed out, like today, people like Naaman will do anything spectacular to ensure their salvation. They will suffer, build churches, give money, sacrifice privileges. But the simple plan of God is for sinners to wash in the blood of Jesus Christ and receive by faith the eternal life he offers. 
And because the plan is so simple, many turn away as Naaman did and refuse the greatest of all gifts. Naaman had to humble himself and ultimately did what God told him to do. If the servants are reasoning, if, by the way, his servants loved him too, if he had bid you do some great thing, you'd, you'd have done it. And he did what God told him to do. It's a humbling thing to do as you're told. It's, it's, a ch it's chastening and humbling to finally admit that you're wrong and you need to just knuckle under and comply. You know, essentially, that is repentance. It's admitting that what God says is so and knuckling under to what God says is so. For Naaman to consent to washing was also to admit it was uncleanness, and he, he had to admit, admit at least in action that his leprosy was what God said it was. That's hard to do. Pride. Pride will keep people lost. Especially if they've been unbelievers all their lives and then confronted with the need for cleansing. I've met people that I think they've rejected Christ so long that now they get into the old age and they think to themselves, well, I can't admit I'm wrong now. You ever meet someone like that? I mean, to, to, to repent and get saved is like admitting they've been wrong all those years. And you know what? It, it is. It's admitting you were wrong. And people don't want to do that because of pride. So... This is a pretty big pill for Naaman to admit that he was needy. But he was a man who experienced God's grace in two senses. Physically, verse 14 says he went down, dipped himself seven times in Jordan, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child. It wasn't just healed, it was new. It was a new creation. Physically, he was healed, but spiritually, he comes back in verse 15, him and all of his company, and he says this, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth. You know what he's saying there? In a polytheistic world, where, where every believe, every, nearly everyone believed in multiple gods, he comes back at the end of that and he says, there's only one. And he's right here. No God in all the earth but in Israel. And then he tries to pay him, which uh, Elisha refuses. Verse 17, note there, and Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given unto thy servant two mules burden of earth for thy servant? will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In ancient times, people believed that gods were associated with localities. And I don't think that was what Naaman was saying, this God's only in Israel. But, but what, they were, what he was doing, he said, let me take some of the ground here, because this, this is the ground <laughs> that God has chosen and blessed. I want to take some of this back. Now, was it accurate and what it, was his theology accurate? No. But his intent was, was good. I'm going to make sacrifices and worship this God, the God of this land, because he's the only one. And I want to take this ground back. He's going to spread around, build an altar, and that's where he's going to do worship. He had come to faith in God as the only God anywhere. Now, I do not think that God's primary purpose for Naaman was for him to be healed of his physical ailment. The objective of all this was not to do something nice for a Gentile. It wasn't be kind to Gentiles week. That wasn't the purpose. The objective was that Naaman might know who God is. It's a powerful na narrative. I mean, <laughs> the narrative of a Gentile, given this much prominence of how God even took the circumstances of a captive little girl 
who came to love her master and made a comment, oh, I wish he would go to see the prophet that's in Israel. Use a little, little girl in this foreign land, the victim of heartbreaking events, and yet God used her in those circumstances. Believer, I don't think it's an accident that you are where you are. You know, sometimes we spend a good share of our time angry about our circumstances. And you ever think to yourself, maybe God has allowed you in those circumstances to serve him in a very particular way. And maybe so that someone else can come to know Christ. Certainly that was true of her. I don't think it's an accident that you are where you are. We often talk about circumstances beyond our control, but fail to realize that they are controlled, controlled circumstances nonetheless. I think God wanted Naaman in a certain place at a certain time to receive something that only God could give. It was not luck. It was not random. It was providence. Perhaps God even brought you here this morning or you're listening online. And you do not know the God of heaven. He would have you know him. But if you are dealing with pride... Whatever that pride may be, pride of intellect, pride of background, pride of what you believe your character is and how good you personally are. If you are that person, you are exactly like Naaman and you need to realize the truth. That you're really needy and you need cleansing from sin and coming to faith in the God who loves you. Naaman just needed to realize he was a needy sinner who needed washed. And so are you. Someone wrote this, and I'll close with this. Pride prevents salvation. Pride was the obstacle in Naaman's life that kept him from experiencing healing that resulted in worship. Pride is such a powerful thing. I believe it can be concluded that the foundation beneath each and every sin that we commit is pride. Because pride says that it is all about who I am and what I want in the face of God who has revealed to us who he is and what he desires. Pride will keep many out of heaven. Don't let pride, my friend, do that to you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together as we reflect upon this man, Naaman. He is the illustration, living illustration of pride and humbling. He's a living illustration of repentance. And I pray that you might use that model in lives of people today. And if there's anyone here that doesn't know, doesn't know the Savior, help them to first remember their need for a savior. The condemnation of sin, the guilt of sin, the rejection of self-righteousness, the rejection of any resources within ourselves that merit your grace. And I pray that in this time of quietness before you, in these few holy moments, but if there's anybody that doesn't know the Savior, I pray that they would come to saving faith, even in this time. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, and we are before God quietly. If you do not know the Savior, my friend, then this is your time. This is the time where you tell God, I know I'm a sinner. I know that I'm condemned. But I know that you love me. And yet you gave your son Jesus to die in my place that I might know forgiveness. I know he took my sin and my condemnation upon himself. And I admit now that I'm a sinner and I am trusting you personally. Thank you for giving Jesus for me. Forgive me and save me for Jesus' sake, I pray. Heavenly Father, if anyone has prayed that prayer, Pray that you might help them to have this matter settled before they leave here today. 
if it is not settled now. Let's stand, shall we, with heads bowed and eyes closed as the hymn of invitation is played. We'll soon be leaving and closing our service out, but I would encourage you once again not to leave this matter unsettled.